Why do people go bald? Why are baboons' bums red? What's a light year? Why do leaves go brown in the autumn? Why do monkeys like bananas? Why do some things glow in the dark? Why do animals not understand? Why do minus heat stayed after a year? Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Chris Smith. Dr Chris from The Naked Scientist. Hello, Chris. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well indeed. How is the world of science this week with you? Well, it's summertime, of course, which means that things are a little bit quieter because scientists have holidays too. But there's some quite interesting stuff going on, including this one which caught my eye because I've had a fly <laughs> buzzing around in here that I cannot catch. You know what their blooming things are like and you can never <laughs> swat them. Well, someone's come to my aid because they're explaining why the buggers are so hard to catch. Uh, this is Michael Dickinson and Gwyneth Card. They're researchers at Caltech in America. They've got a paper in Current Biology this week where they have studied using very fast motion photography exactly what a fly does when you approach it with a fly swatter. And they've discovered that the fly brain takes the visual image because flies can see almost 360 degrees around themselves. And within a tenth of a second, the fly has assessed the direction that you're coming from with your tea towel or your swatter and and it has programmed a movement into the fly so that it changes its posture in just the right way that it can immediately flip off and disappear and you can never catch it. So flies are at a massive advantage over us because your movements cannot occur quickly enough. I think from the time you first see a fly to the time you execute that deft swatting manoeuvre, it takes at least a third to a half a second from you first seeing the fly to actually being able to program and execute that movement. So, uh, in other words, flies are at least five times faster than we are, so we're not going to catch them. Unfortunately, in the paper, there is no convenient advice on how you do deal with the problem, so I think probably fly spray to disable the nervous system of the fly. That's probably the best pit. Poor flies. Dear. No, they're horrible things. They spread diseases and everything. And nasty. Well, I know they do. In fact, um, there's a little story here in the news that I've found here. A nasty new species of insect has been found after it hatched on a scientist's desk. They obviously want to be discovered, these things, you see, Chris. Um, a chance discovery of the parasitic bug was made by a Welsh researcher who was studying the life cycle of tiny marsh flies in fields in Ireland. Um, he was waiting for flies to hatch in jam jars on his desk when, to his, his surprise, two different species of parasitic wasp crawled out. How scary is that? <laughs> Just amazing, isn't it? It's a good job he didn't work on something really horrible like anthrax or some kind of nasty infection because then he could have caught that instead. But no, it's good when the science comes to you rather than you having to go to it. Indeed. It's time now to uh, ask the questions. And uh, so far, people are uh, calling in in their droves. Hedera has heard about injections for wet macular disease, Chris. She has dry macular disease. Does this mean that she should ask her doctor if there is anything she should do? Ah, well, let's first of all look at what macular degeneration is. This is um, age-related and it's where the photoreceptors, which are the specialised nerve cells in the retina, in the back of the eye, those cells are the ones that convert light into nerve signals the brain can understand, and they're basically how we see. They're in the part of the brain called the macula, which is also known as the yellow spot, and that's the bit of the eye which is the most sensitive to vision. So when you're looking at someone, when you're watching television, when you're reading a book, you're focusing the bit you're paying attention to onto that part of your retina. So if you lose those photoreceptors, then the acuity, your ability to focus down to very tiny points and make out and discern fine detail, that begins to diminish. And there are two forms of macular degeneration. There's the wet form and the dry form. What, di what discriminates them is that in the wet form, new blood vessels form in the layer beneath the retina and they're not very um, effective at keeping blood inside them. They're leaky and they tend to burst and they can leach materials out onto the retina which are in fact toxic to the retina. So they can poison the retina and as a result the vision declines there. And the controversy we've had this week with the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, uh, making what some people have called a U-turn on the prescription of the agent Lucentis. Um, this is all about this particular drug which can reverse or halt the progression of wet macular degeneration. And the way Lucentis works, it's a specialised antibody. The, the actual um, name of the antibody is ranibizumab. Well done. And <laughs> easy for you to say, <laughs> not for me. 
Um, and, the, and the way it works is by blocking the formation of new blood vessels. The other form of macular degeneration being dry macular degeneration is not associated with the formation of these new blood vessels and therefore it may not have the same benefit to those patients. But it's always worth uh, asking your doctor to keep an eye on things and also to keep you abreast of any new developments or, or possibly clinical trials that are going on because sometimes there are trials going on that people can become involved in and if sight is deteriorating and people are feeling that they may want to be adventurous and, and try something new sometimes th this can have amazing outcomes and, and so it's worth asking people to keep you up to date. Kayleigh in Nebworth asks what actually is a flame? Is there any matter or is it all just energy? Dr Chris. Certainly energy, but a flame is not actually a substance. Um, it's, it's not got any physical substance to it. You, you couldn't sort of feel it if you touched it, apart from the fact that it would feel hot. And that's because a flame is literally vapour. So when you burn something, say I take a piece of paper and I light it, what's happening is the heat from actually me applying a match to a piece of paper starts to heat up the paper material, the cellulose in the paper, and this causes the molecules to begin to vaporise. So in other words, they break apart and they go up in the air. They mix with oxygen from the air and this causes them to combust. So a chemical reaction occurs whereby the carbon in the material gets oxygen added onto it and becomes carbon dioxide. You also make some water because the hydrogen mixes with oxygen. You get H2O, water. And because these chemical reactions are making new bonds... Whenever you make chemical bonds, you make heat, you make some energy. And so that's why you feel the heat. And the flame has colour because various chemicals, doesn't matter which chemical you're looking at, different chemicals all have their own specific colour. This is called spectroscopy, actually, and it's how we know what the composition of a distant star is. We can look at the sun, for example. We know exactly what chemicals are in the sun without having to physically go there and get a sample of it because by looking at the colour of the sun, the chemicals give themselves away because they're emitting light of certain wavelengths. And so a flame is literally... Um, basically the, the heat exciting atoms of different chemicals that are in the flame, they then release some of that excited energy in the form of light we can see and the combination of those light wavelengths gives the flame its colour and that's why different flames coming from different things produce different colours and tend to burn in different ways because you're, depending on what you're burning you make it a different flame colour. That's why gas gives you that interesting blue colour whereas uh, a lump of coal might burn yellow because there's lots of soot and carbon particles in there. If you chuck on a whole load of um, bits of wood you might get orange flames because there's a lot of sodium in the wood and sodium is orange and you know that by looking at street lights right um we had uh, an email in from daniel who says uh, a couple of days ago i had pleasure of watching my village firework night and i thought that would be a brilliant topic for the naked scientists so my question for this week is what actually is a firework and why do they seem to burst after launching into the air well, the best person to ask about this would actually be uh, Ron Lancaster from Kim Bolton Fireworks, who's one of the big fireworks experts in the whole of the eastern region. Um, but the basis behind a firework is it's an explosive, but it's set up so that it's an explosive in a controlled way. In other words, it doesn't blow up locally. It go somewhere and then does its stuff. So it's all in the packaging, really. You have a chemical reaction, which uh, is energetic, produces a lot of gas, and that gas is vented or released initially inside a cardboard tube. And this means that because the gas is taking up a lot of space, it pr can propel the body of the firework, the other combustibles, out of the tube and up into the air. So we're talking about things like rockets and mortars here. Um, once they get up in the air, you then set your firework in such a way that then it, it burns from the outside in, and by arranging the various combustibles in appropriate layers, separated by appropriate waddings and things, you can make them burn for more or less time. You can affect how hot they burn, and therefore you can affect how quickly they go off and um, how explosively, and also what colours they are, because you can mix various chemicals in there to change the colour. We were talking earlier about how you can tell the composition of distant stars by looking at their colour. Mm. That's because different chemicals um, when they get he heated up or excited some of their atoms get pushed up to a slightly higher energy level uh, the electrons around the atom rather and when those electrons fall back to their normal energy level they give out that energy again in the form of light we can see and so by choosing your chemicals carefully you can tweak the mixture to get the right colour combination that you're after Thank you very much Dr Chris um, Mike Melbourne has emailed in to ask you what the difference in weight would be of, say, a large oak tree when it's in leaf compared to when all the leaves have dropped? Can you work it well, out? Well, the, 
There was a guy in the States who did some leaf counting experiments. He calculated that the number of leaves on a 48-foot-high tall maple tree was about 177,000. Um, so that's quite a lot. And if you weigh the leaf of something like an oak tree or a horse chestnut tree, probably between 1 and 5 grams is the weight of the average leaf. So if you times 5 grams, take an upper limit, by, say, 200,000, we'll call it a big tree, that's about a million grams. And a million grams is a 1,000 kilograms, and a 1,000 kilograms is a tonne. So a deciduous tree, when it's in leaf in the summertime and it's not dehydrated, should have an additional one tonne of weight up on, up on its branches. But when the tree itself weighs tens of tonnes, actually that's a very small contribution to the overall weight of the tree. And the really big problem with leaves is that they're designed to have a big surface area. In other words, to present a big area to the sun, because at the end of the day, those leaves are the tree's solar panels. They capture the sun's energy and they use it and they harness the sun's energy to drive chemical reactions for to synthesis to make oxygen that we can breathe and then sugars, glucose, that they then turn into starch that, depending upon whether you're uh, a potato or something else we can eat, that's energy that we take into our bodies and then consume. So um, at the end of the day, leaves have to have a big surface area and that is a problem because they are very good at catching the wind as well. So far more damaging to a tree is not so much the weight of water it puts out on its branches every summer, it's actually the wind coming along and exerting a huge force on the tree because of this big surface area it's presenting. If you add up the surface area of all those leaves, it comes to about a sixth of an acre on top of your average tree. Gosh, that's loads, isn't it? Oh, it's massive, and that's why trees are so effective. Aren't they just? Now, Carol in Braintree says that she buys Imperial Leather Soap, and on it is a sticker. Yes, we all know that famous brand, don't we? But what she wants to know is, when it gets wet, why doesn't the sticker fall off? <laughs> um, I reckon they must have done a bit of research on that to make sure it didn't. Um, I think part of the reason is that in order to detach from the soap, the sticker has to uh, get, that water has to get between the sticker and the soap. Um, and I think if you make a very good seal around the uh, edge of the sticker so that it's well embedded in the soap, then the soap ought to shrink around the sticker and v rather than the water getting underneath the sticker and separating it. The sticker does come off eventually, um, but I think it's because it's, it's prevented from actually water getting underneath all of the sticker, so it's very hard for it to separate. I suspect they also maybe use a choice of glue, which um, is quite good at sticking to the soap and maybe even repels water for a short while. Mm. It's clever anyway, isn't it? And you never just end up with a sticker. You just end up with that little fiddly bit at the end, don't you? If you're enjoying Ask the Naked Scientist, then you might like to check out The Naked Scientist, our regular roundup of the world's best science. Each week we take a look at the latest science news, talk to top researchers working at the coalface of discovery, and also get our hands dirty with a science experiment that you can join in with too. So make it a date and prepare to strip down science on the web at nakedscientist.com slash podcast. Gus has sent an email in, and this is quite scary. He says, um, if a flu pandemic hit the world, like the Spanish flu of 1918, would the results be as serious as then when 20 to 40 million were killed? Mm, that's the big question that uh, governments and healthcare professionals all around the world are asking themselves. Gus is quite right. When the 1918 flu came to town... It was the end of the First World War, and many people, many virologists, blame the First World War for actually helping the flu to get started because so many thousands of people were moving all over the earth, having been massed in one place on a battlefield. And then, then it, this helped because they all went home again afterwards to distribute the flu around the world, which might have contributed to the fact that 20 to 40 million people did die in that pandemic. Um, there have been a number of outbreaks of flu in the last 100 years. So the 1918 was one of them. That was the Spanish flu and by far and away the most dramatic. The type of flu that that caused was one called H1N1. Um, a long time went by before we saw the flu back again, though, and it didn't resurface until the 1950s. And when it came back in the 1950s, it produced uh, the Asian flu pandemic. And this was far less dramatic. About a million people died during that. And this was a, a viral form called H2N2. And then in the 1960s, 1968, um, we got the Hong Kong flu pandemic surfacing. That was H3N2. So these are all different forms of flu that were coming along. Mm -hmm. And this one was much less dramatic still. This one killed about 
a quarter of a million people. Not small numbers, but at the same time, if you compare that with, say, HIV, which is currently affecting about 45 million people uh, worldwide and infecting a new uh, four to five million people every year, one in two people in South Africa currently um, of childbearing age is HIV positive, for example, so a big problem. Um, that, that's actually quite a small number. Um, the thing, the thing that pe- people are really worried about with the flu today is that the world's a very different place than it was even in the late 60s. The, the estimate is that at any given time, about half a million people are airborne around the earth in aeroplanes. And what that means is that people are very mobile and no city is now more than about 24 hours from any other city. And this means that you could, in theory, have picked up a virus on one side of the earth, be asymptomatic and be on the other side of the world, of the world and spreading it to people before you've even realised that you've got something and you've transmitted it in this way. So human movements are much greater now. Also, the human population is much greater now. We've got six and a half billion people on earth. And also, um, people's population density, the fact that we're living much closer together now, is is greater than it's ever been. And all of these factors will affect the spread and dynamics of infectious diseases. Then you've got to add on to the equation, well, what about modern health care? Can that do anything? What can modern drugs do? And the answer is that we just don't know, because we've never been in this position before. So we've never had to sort of pit our present modern-day world, our present modern-day lifestyle, and our present modern-day health care system against a present modern-day pandemic. And uh, I think the answer is that the outlook, despite those mitigating factors, is still pretty grim. Uh, Grim enough that doctors and healthcare professionals internationally are advising governments to spend money in billions and not millions of pounds. Gosh, that's something, isn't it? We'll perhaps have to have a virus check as well as we go through airports in the future. I think it's inevitable, and there are ways now that this can be done. And, for instance, when I flew to, when I went to Australia in 2004, it was not long after the SARS um, business had mm-hmm. resurfaced because SARS was kicking around in 2003, and there was a little mini resurgence in 2004. And at Singapore Airport, when I flew in, they had thermal cameras that were being used to survey all of the passengers coming through the airport. And anyone running a temperature was being hoiked out because this is one of the first-line ways that you can control the spread of infectious diseases by isolating cases very rapidly and reducing the number of people they come into contact with and also isolating the people that they've been in contact with. And the the, the word quarantine actually comes from, from Venice because um, about um, 1500s, um, the Venetians knew that there was an infectious period and that there was an incubation period for infectious diseases, and so they established this time when anything came in by boat, it had to stay on the boat initially for 30 days, and then and then if all the people were still alive after 30 days the boat was allowed to be unloaded but they discovered that there was a few infections slipping through the net so they made the 30 days into 40 days quarantina and hence we get quarantine today because of the 40 day gap that had to be left before anybody could get off a boat in venice a few hundred years ago what a fantastic mind of information you are you really are chris thank you so much for that now uh jim in mablethorpe has a question. He asks, why a tea bag floats when you pour boiling water on it, but sinks when you pour cold water on it? Okay. Um, I think the reason for this is when you actually put the water on the tea bag, although as many brands of uh, tea, be- of, uh, tea bags have been shown to have thousands of perforations, in one case, a manufacturer of tea bags uh, claimed to have a certain number of perforations, and someone got onto Blue Peter by having got a magnifying glass and counted them all and showed that, in fact, the number being reported was a bit inaccurate. Um, I wonder what he does for a day job now. Um, anyway, um, when you put your water onto your tea bag, the water forms a thin film over the tea bag. And in the same way as if you've ever done that life-saving thing where you jump into a swimming pool with your pyjamas and if you tie knots in the legs of your pyjamas and then fill them with air, uh, the water on the fabric forms tiny um, sort of of like bubbles in the fabric and this prevents the air from inside the pyjamas moving out through the fabric. It traps air in the the fabric and you get sort of a a life buoy, don't you, to hang on to. And the same thing happens in your tea bag. So when you put the hot water in, you get this water sheen over the surface of the tea bag which blocks the air inside the tea bag. The heat from the hot water heats up the air in the tea bag. The air becomes much less dense and, and hot because some will inevitably escape.
shape, and this, I think, helps to make the tea bag more buoyant, putting it to the top of the liquid. Um, at the same time, the hot water, especially if you've got milk in the tea first, the coldest water will be at the bottom of the mug and the hottest water will be at the top, so there's also an upthrust coming on, which is, pu- which is pushing the tea bag upwards. So there's a number of factors at play here which keep the tea bag at the top. If you put the cold water in, that mitigates that effect, and the tea bag sinks. Now, let's get back to some flies again. Um, Joby has sent a text in to say um, when he rolls a newspaper up and goes on a fly swatting spree, he rarely fails to swat the beasties. Um, but he was always <laughs> told that a fly takes off by flying backwards. And also, um, it's a Dot in Buck- Buckinghamshire. She says in a restaurant abroad, they hang plastic bags full of water up outside. Apparently, it attracts the flies, giving them a full sense of direction, keeping them away from customers and their food. What do you think about that? Um, the, the fly taking off backwards, um, I think that the, this paper in Current Biology, which if anyone wants to read it, it's a very, very funny paper. You can see the pictures of the fly's posture. Um, the flies just change their body posture to take off in whichever direction is going to be most convenient in order for them to get away. Um, when a fly is on, a, on the ceiling, though, that's a bit different because when a fly drops off the ceiling, the first thing it does is it lets go with its front legs and then does a sort of a, a somersault in the air. So it's then pointing the right way before it activates its wings and buzzes off. Um, If you want to swat a fly successfully, I think you've got to plan your manoeuvre from a distance. You've got to know exactly what the trajectory is going to be and then do it very fast Uh, because flies, as we've said, have such fast reactions that they will be able to pre-program a movement to get them out of the way well before you can actually take avoiding action to try and outwit them. So you've got to be fast and decisive, I think, is the answer to this one. Now then, um, on the telephones, let's go to the telephone. Uh, Ray is on the line. Good evening, Ray. Uh, good evening. Uh, you're through to Dr Chris. Hi, Ray. Good evening. I just wondered if you can e- explain the um, the science behind the the modern design of a wind turbine as opposed to um, the old type of windmills that were quite prolific around here back, say, 100 years or so. Is, is the power generated by lift on the sails or is it um, air on an inclined surface that is forcing it round? Sure, OK. Well, 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 let me take those two things in turn, Ray. Um, the first one is why are they designed and shaped the way that they are? Um, that reason for that is all down to engineering. Windmills had to be the shape that they were because the fabrics and, and the materials and the structures they had to work with, to a certain extent, dictated the way the windmill was going to have to look. In order to, to tolerate the force that was going to be placed on the structure, it had to be big and it had to have sails like that to get the necessary force from the air. Wind generators, wind turbines to make things like electricity, are doing a slightly different job, and they're doing that against a slightly different load than your traditional windmill to, say, grind corn to make flour. So slightly different job means slightly different design, and also the materials used have improved enormously, so people now can use much lighter but also much stronger materials, and this means you don't have to have such a big surface area of blade in contact with the air in order to get the same amount of force out of it because everything's moving much better. How it actually turns wind into movement is that the shape of the blades is set up such that as the air travels over the blade, it's caused to spin, and instead of going in one direction, it turns, and as it turns, it gives a push or a kick to the blade, pushing the blade round. And so that's why the um, blades are the shape they are, because the wind will always push them in one direction, and they're always getting a push sideways at 90 degrees to the wind because the wind is being deflected off off the blade. And there's an interesting uh, paper that got published a week ago in the journal Current Biology, um, and that is that wind turbines are very bad for bats because off the back of the blade, around the tips of the blade, there's a very low pressure area because the wind is spinning there, And because it's spinning, it's being flung outwards by centrifugal force. Horrible term, but it's convenient to think of it that way. And if you're flinging air outwards, you're leaving an area in the centre which has got less air in it, so there must be less pressure there. And if little bats fly into that area, um, it's causing them to have something called barrow trauma. And this is where your lungs try to inflate too fast and and they burst. So bad for bats, but good for the environment in other ways, potentially. Yeah, why don't they use... Uh, multiple of blades are. I mean, why do, the maximum always seems to be three, you know, I'd have thought. 
why not six blades? Why not ten blades? Well, the answer is that it's all down to people having done models of what's the most efficient way to get the most energy. If you put more blades on, you've got to have a bigger structure that weighs more, and therefore it's going to also have more resistance, and it's going to cost more to maintain. And if you do all the sums and work out what the best payoff is to get the most energy from the lowest wind speeds or the average wind speeds, you arrive at a design similar to that which is being used today. OK, okay Ray, thank you very much yeah. indeed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Now, Dr. Chris, Max in Braintree says, Hi there, some friends and I were wondering, what is heavy water? Uh, Heavy water is not what you would have seen on a BBC comedy programme from about 20 years ago called The Naked Video, where a bloke lifts a big bowl of it and goes, yeah, that's pretty heavy. (laughs) Heavy water is water in which the hydrogen, H, is not hydrogen, it's an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. Now, hydrogen, in fact, any element, any chemical, can come in a number of different different flavours, if you like. Um, if you look at uh, any atom, you'll find that it's got a certain number of protons, they're positive, in the nucleus, and buzzing around the outside will be electrons, they're minus. But also in the nucleus will be things called neutrons. They don't have any charge, but they're there to stabilise the nucleus. Now, hydrogen, the simple thing, has no neutrons at all. It just has one proton and there's one electron whizzing around the outside. But you can get an isotope of hydrogen, and I think about one in every 5,000 atoms of hydrogen in, say, the sea, um, is what's called deuterium. And if you look at deuterium, it's got one proton in the nucleus, and there is one neutron in there too. And the reason people are interested in it is because you can use this uh, to fuel certain kinds of nuclear reactions, because you can fuse this together to make other chemicals. And so you can make a bomb that way. And the Germans were very interested in making lots of heavy water in World War II because they viewed that as a good source of fuel for uh, a nuclear weapon. So that's heavy water. Andrew from Cambridge asked Chris if you could quickly explain what a Dalton is in terms of measurement of molecular weight. Okay. well, if in the old days you went to the greengrocers, um, then they would have a pan and you'd put the fruit and vegetables you wanted to buy into the pan and then on the other side, on a sort of flat table, you would put some weights and you would put in maybe a kilo if you were very hungry and you bought a lot of fruit and veg, 500 grams, whatever. And you, you do that until you get a sort of balance. So basically... What I'm, what I'm getting at is that there are units of mass and when you buy a big sack of potatoes we measure those masses in kilograms because we need a big mass, a big unit to describe that. If you're measuring cars and the weights of boats and things you use tonnes. Well when you get down to the scale of something like an atom which is so very tiny that it's incredibly big big series of noughts after the decimal point um, then you're getting to the point where it would be stupid to use a kilogram and so we tend to talk more in terms of atomic weights or Dalton. So a Dalton is basically a convenient way of describing the weights of atoms. So when you make a molecule or something you tot up which atoms you've got in it. We know what their relative masses are and when you tot those relative masses up then you can express that in Daltons and this gives you some idea as to the size of the molecule without having to, to quote stupid numbers um, with lots of uh, zeros after a decimal point in kilograms um, although you could do that if you really wanted to Thank you Chris uh, Sue says Alan in Ashton Clinton in Buckinghamshire Could you please ask Chris why if a fly if flies are so quick are they stuck all over the front of my car? Good one, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that the answer is that when your car's coming along, it's doing 60 miles an hour, and, and a fly um, doesn't necessarily get out of the way in time. It may also be that uh, the vortex, the air swirling around the car, means the fly finds it very hard to escape in time. When it tries to get away, it gets sucked in around the car as the jet stream is, is um, drawn over the car surface. So I think there's a number of reasons why flies have it um, not in their favour when you come along at 60 or 70 miles an hour in your car towards them. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget, you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com.